afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Wheel here, and welcome back to another one of my Learn to Lead series videos, and in today's video, we will be talking about Civil Air Patrol's Learn to Lead Chapter 5. Now, if you have not previously watched one of my other videos, I will have a link in the iCard right up here, and it will show you the different chapters that I have done so far, which is chapters 1 through 5 in the Learn to Lead books. I'm a little bit further ahead in the Learn to Lead materials than the Aerospace Dimensions and Journey of Flight books, but I will be getting to that. It's just that I want to balance my Aerospace Dimension stuff with the Learn to Lead stuff as I progress through the books. Recently, I haven't made as many of the Learn to Lead videos, and I would like to publish this one so that you guys can continue to <laughs> get more content as you promote through the ranks. And this is a helpful resource as you are preparing for your milestone tests. Disclaimer! This is not sponsored by Civil Air Patrol in any way, shape, or form. I'm just doing this to be a helpful resource. If you are studying for your tests, make sure you read the books before you watch this video, or at least use this video as a review for what you've previously learned. Just watching these videos, yes, they will help, but normally they quote things directly from the book. And if you read the book and you're at least familiar with the material, then you'll definitely do a lot better. So there's a lot of different questions that they can ask, and just being familiar with the text will really, really help in being familiar with some of the words or like the way that some sentences are structured. So just, just knowing how things are being put out there in the different questions and looking at how the structure is between each test will help prepare for any milestone test you might take. So, in today's video, we're talking about the brain power for leadership, which is talking about some logical fallacies, it talks about different thinking strategies, and I'm going to go over each of these different things, and a few mnemonics I have personally used to help study for my spots exam, which I passed. So, stay tuned guys, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Critical thinking is self-guided, self-disciplined thinking that helps you find the highest level of quality in a fair way of thinking. And this directly influences the effectiveness of whatever you do. So for example, instead of just looking at one news source and saying, wow, I accept this, you can think critically and you can look at that source and you can say, hmm, these are some interesting ideas and I want to gain more resources and more knowledge before I make a final decision on whatever it is that's being presented. For example, someone might say, this is the best puppy ever. And then when you get to meet the puppy and interact with the puppy, the puppy may not be as nice as you originally thought it would be. And by critically thinking, then you can eventually evaluate the situation and think back and say, hmm, perhaps that was not the nicest puppy. And just not just trusting things at face value and putting your own perspective on things to make sure that you're looking at things in a fair way. And it also mentions that critical thinking is a way of being. I'm going to teach you guys a mnemonic now and it's called CAP R Double. And these are the intellectual standards used within critical thinking. There's clarity of ideas. Accuracy of information, precision in knowing statements mean what they mean, relevance of the issue, depth of the factors and the complexity of the issue, breadth of how far one will look to either side to see the different parts of the issue, and logic to support ideas. Now, each of these things I definitely recommend looking into a little bit of depth. Um, just like look at backing up claims and supporting claims with evidence that can be further supported. Like, if you're talking about the importance of sleep, you will sound more credible if you cite a sleep study that was conducted recently, rather than talking about uh, what, what some five-year-old told you about sleep isn't important or something like that. So just ensuring that you have a well-rounded argument when you are presenting your ideas. Now I'm going to talk about the modes of thinking, which there is another mnemonic, which is a fun one. It's called Big Fries, which is big picture thinking, focus thinking, realistic thinking, and shared thinking. Big picture thinking is looking at a situation as a whole. Focus thinking is narrowing in your attention on a specific issue and then addressing it as needed. And unfocused thinking can lead to not responding effectively to a situation. 
Realistic thinking is known normally as common sense, and shared thinking is typically something like the law, like the constitution is shared principles across an entire culture or civilization. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about logical fallacies. If you've taken a higher level English course, you typically talk about logical fallacies when you are doing some kind of persuasive paper. So I'm going to list them out and briefly describe a few of them. But if you would like more in-depth information, I highly recommend you look at the book. It provides great examples of what each of them mean. There's appeal to authority, appeal to tradition, there's red herrings, weak analogies, straw man fallacies, um, circular reasoning, and ad hominem, false dilemmas, slippery slopes. There, there's a ton of them. And I'll talk about each one just, just a little bit. Straw man is where you misrepresent the opposition. So whenever you're citing something, um, in an argument, then it's always good to know the whole context of the piece that you're taking information from and not just like a specific sentence because the, the intent and the context of that information really is important when you are presenting something. Red herring? Look, it's a bird! Red herring is when something is completely unrelated to what you were doing and it, it's basically a distraction. It's not relevant. So you may think of the, the bird example as something or you could say that my argument is that dogs are smarter than cats because fish live in the ocean that doesn't necessarily mean that it's false fish do live in the ocean but that has nothing to do with me saying that dogs are smarter than cats or dogs are better than cats and it's like it just doesn't actually support the argument slippery slope is where you say one thing will happen which will lead to another thing which will lead to another thing so an example might be i am making cupcakes but the cupcakes are going to burn and if the cupcakes burn then the oven will be lit on fire and then the house will be on fire which will blow up the entire neighborhood that's, that's a lot, but it's intensifying the gravity of something when it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to go step by step like that because it does not have to happen like that and it's gradually making things worse over time. Appeal to tradition is basically just, we've always done it this way, so we will keep doing it this way. Sometimes continuing doing what you've been doing does work, but in a lot of cases, there is room for improvement. So just because something has been the way that it is, doesn't necessarily mean it's the most productive or positive way to continue existencing as an organization. Appeal to authority is nine out of 10 doctors approve of this product. And just the authority of a doctor makes you feel like, hey, may maybe this is an actual product that is good. Or if you're watching a Gatorade commercial and you see Shaq come up there and he's like, oh yeah, this is so refreshing. Or if you see um, like movie celebrities, like they're, they're showing off watches and they're like, yeah, be like me. Or those perfume commercials with celebrities. Those are appeal to authority because people are like, oh yes. This authority knows things and I should do what they do. And so it's it's following that basic modeling from people who may not necessarily have experience in whatever it is, like saying, hey, this is the best watch, even though you've just acted in a lot of movie, movies, they're probably just getting paid for those kind of things. So that's about everything that I'm gonna cover with logical fallacies. It, and just as a reminder, logical fallacies are errors in reasoning so it's it's just holes in your logic that you may find or holes in logical arguments that you may find and they're everywhere so just keep these things in mind when you're creating some kind of argument to present like in a persuasive speech or persuasive essay there's something that it the book says which is integrity ties with intellectual honesty and Intellectual honesty is defined as the honesty in acquisition and analysis of 
ideas and transmitting those ideas. It's a little weird, it just kind of like popped in there, but you know, it's, it's just something that I, I had read and I thought it would be important to include. It's important, I promise. Eh. Eh. Creative thinking is an important part of leadership and it's combining concentration with imagination. Now, creative thinking isn't necessarily like, wow, you're a great painter, or being able to mold a, a piece of clay into this beautiful sculpture. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but creative thinking is um, a way to think of new solutions outside of the box and really challenge what your ideas are in new and exciting ways. So for example, if you were facing an issue where a cadet might be too hot at encampment and you're serving as staff, creative thinking would enable you to think of different solutions that might help the cadet and you, you do it right on the spot. So you might take your, your clipboard or your binder or whatever you might be holding your papers with and like fan them and you might think of areas that you can put them in shade where the nearest hydration station is, anything like that. And that would be creative thinking, coming up with solutions and doing your best with the situation and then handling it from there, like getting a health services officer, stuff like that. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about the tools for creative thinking and I have a mnemonic. Before my five reads head for more pro gears. This may or may not work for you. It worked for me when I took my spots. I played the clarinet, so I was like, reads, that works. It may not work for you, I just, I took the first letter of each word that was involved with the, the creative thinking, and then I just created that. It's a weird sentence that doesn't necessarily make any sense, but it's, it's something that I found to be pretty useful because I, I had memorized a lot of different mnemonics simultaneously, and then if I saw one key word like creative thinking, then I could think of, okay, here's here's each word in that sentence, and then I would go through my list of words to think of what that concept was asking or what the question was asking in terms of what I needed to know for the concept. There's brainstorming, mind mapping, the five whys, reversal, headlines for the future, or headlines of the future, multi-voting, flow charts, pros and cons, and gradual voting. Now, some of these are in a group setting and some of them you can do on your own. For example, brainstorming. If you find that you're having writer's block or you can't think through something, then just start writing your ideas down. By writing those ideas down, writing ideas that may not be so great could eventually lead to better ideas or more effective solutions. And then doing that as a group, collectively brainstorming, you could have like an open forum where people can express their ideas and as a group can come together to create one consensus of a solution, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit with some of the multi-voting and gradual voting options. There's also mind mapping, where you start with a central idea and then you create little bubbles for where the idea will go. So for example, the central idea might be fundraising. And then if you don't know where to go, then you might think of, well, what, what are different options? So options for fundraising might go here. Um, locations might be another bubble. Um, interests or dates other things like that and kind of like brainstorming how that can branch off. And then each of those bubbles would have their own branches and then you have a nice little map of where your ideas are going. And this can definitely be helpful if you are trying to plan like something that has like a step-by-step -step process. So if you are putting together a plan for fundraising, then you need to know who's involved, what is required of you to put together the activity. Like if you need, approval to do it or materials that you might need in order to do it anything like that why you're doing it what the money will be used for any any of those things could be put out there but it is up to you as to what would go into that mind map the five whys is just asking why so you know a little kid when you're like hey could you stop doing that they're like why and they're like because i said so and they're like why well if you ask why 
then that's a good way to debrief. So if, if something happened at an activity, for example, a cadet tripped, fell, and they twisted their ankle, for example, then you would ask, why was the cadet outside? Why did they twist their ankle? Why were they doing that specific activity? It's a very vague example, I know, but asking the question why and then specifying what you want to know within that can help you determine the causes of something and then areas for future improvement. Reversal is another debriefing technique where you start from the point that you're currently at and you work your way back. Future headlines, the, the headlines of the future one, that one is basically imagining what the idea could become in the future. So if you were to do orientation rides for your cadets at your squadron, they're required to do one within the first month of joining, then a headline for the future might be Squadron completes all orientation rides for new students, or for new cadets. And then working your way towards achieving that goal. Flow charts are a way to analyze the effectiveness of, a, of like an organization. So a flow chart you might use is like how meetings are conducted, or like the structure of an organization and looking at the flow of information, like passing it down the chain of command or sending it directly, stuff like that. Multi-voting is where you gradually gain a consensus with the entire group and you, you, mul you vote in multiple rounds. So the first round would have all of the ideas and then you'd gradually work down to where it's only against like one or two different options. And then all of the group is on board with one. Then there's also pros and cons where you know Ross from Friends, he has his, his yellow legal pad and he has to write his pros and cons. Well, it, it works. If you're trying to find the best possible solution for a problem, then if you have two options, just writing the good things or the bad things about them and then comparing the two lists can really help you determine what the best way is to move forward. Gradual voting is where you work your way from the bottom of, of like uh, organizational structure and you vote on, or th the lowest level votes on what they would like to see. So if there's, um, if there's a feedback survey that's sent out and you're looking to see what area people would like to see the most change, then you might ask like, would you like to see change in emergency services, cadet programs, or aerospace education? Send that survey out and then, or have all the, the members participate, ask them that question, who feels like this area needs the most improvement and having the lowest ranking officers do it first to limit the influence of higher ranking individuals within the organization. There's something discussed in the chapter called status quo, which is associated with you just going with the flow with the majority. So an example might be that everyone thinks that you should go for a four mile run right here, right now at the squadron meeting and the status quo that would be that everyone goes out on that four mile run they may not have taken different things under consideration like it's about to thunderstorm or it's about to to um be night and there won't be any lights anywhere and you don't know if it's safe or not um it's possible that you aren't living in a safe area and they're like yeah let's let's go let's let's just run wherever don't just follow the status quo um, there's something called bystander effect, which is essentially where you think the, the responsibility is placed onto other people in a situation and you just don't take action. So there are examples out there where someone might be having like a heart attack and no one really knows what to do or they don't know what to help with or they can't determine if it's an emergency or not. There, there's like a step-by-step -step process that leads to bystander effect or action, which I won't go into, but I have studied it and don't be a bystander if you see a situation that just like doesn't look quite right at least do something about it if you yourself don't feel like you can handle the situation like if you're at an encampment and you see a cadre member doing something that you don't think they should be doing at least talk to your your next trusted um supervisor about the situation and say hey this is something that i noticed and they could potentially take action even if you are not trained to do so. So if you see something, say something, especially if it's something unsafe, um, use the phrase knock it off 
and they are supposed to knock it off and stop doing what they're doing. Also, when you're leading a group, setting learning objectives is really, really important. A learning objective is the end goal of what your students or your cadets should be taking away from whatever it is that you're doing. For example, if you're teaching basic drill and ceremonies, then you want to have a progression. And so the first night you're teaching drill and ceremonies, you might just do stationary, standing at attention, and then doing like at ease, stand at attention, parade rest, and show the differences between those different things. And then you can build progression between each of those stages so that your cadets feel like they are improving and they are learning across the different lessons that you are providing. There are also different learning styles. Visual means that you are watching, auditory means you are listening, um, tactile means you are touching, and kinesthetic means you're actually doing. So for me personally, I like to be able to watch someone as they are talking to me and then be able to demonstrate the skills as they are talking to me. So most of the time you should combine as many different instructional methods that fit different learning styles in order for everyone to get something out of your lesson. Lectures are the most common method of instruction. So if you think of a, a classroom, like in a high school, out of college, teachers are typically, or professors are typically teaching lecture style. There's also guided discussions. Sometimes you might have those in English classes where you're talking about a book and then each person has to contribute something or um, what is it, a Socratic seminar where each person like, they're like, hmm, this is my question. What do you think of this? And then someone else has to respond and then someone else has to respond. And then the, <laughs> the teacher takes tally marks on how involved everyone is. I mean, it, it works. There's also the performance or dem demonstration and performance instructional method. So for me, when I was doing um, a psychology lab, we had to uh, dissect things, which I won't go into too much detail. It's kind of weird. Um, th the professor would demonstrate something to us and then we would have to perform that action after it being demonstrated. There's also experimental and simulation. So experimental might be where you are learning it by doing it and you're trying it out on your own and then you can be given feedback. And then simulation might be, if you think of flight simulator, it's where you are put into a cockpit on your computer and then you can like practice doing different maneuvers and doing controls and stuff with a keyboard and mouse. It's not necessarily the same thing as getting into an airplane, but it is simulating and showing you what the real situation might feel like, but it might actually show you what it feels like to be in the cockpit. Whenever you are instructing, it's always good to evaluate how much your learners or your, your cadets, whoever you're teaching is getting out of the experience. Whether you use a test, an inspection, um, or just generally providing feedback, by evaluating their performance, they can further improve from there. So in the Learn to Lead books, you are taking tests for each chapter, and then you take a milestone test at the end to demonstrate your understanding of all the concepts that have been presented before. And with drill and ceremonies, you are demonstrating in person, typically in person, in, in the case of right now, not really, um, demonstrating your ability to perform different drill maneuvers or even command different drill maneuvers as you become an NCO. And inspections in person, like they check the, the distance of your insignia from the edge of your collar. Hey, if you, if you do want more information on uniforms, this is up there, but I'm, I'm gonna keep going. But there are a lot of different ways to evaluate. And as you evaluate, you can see how each person is performing and provide them with individual consideration by helping them out as they progress and making them feel empowered and important as a part of your organization. So there is a lot of information jam-packed in chapter five, and I know this is a little bit longer of a video. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I appreciate your guys' support. Thank you so much for being awesome and watching the channel if you got all the way to the end of this video. But yeah, definitely, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And if you can, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already. I do always appreciate that. So that's all I have for you guys. And that is all, folks. Until next time, toodles.